going to give everyone just a couple of seconds to sign on here and join us in the Zoom room. Looks like we have a steady flow of folks joining us this morning. With that, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Successful Export Strategies and Building Business Connections, featuring our 2020 World Trade Week Award honorees. My name is Jasmine Sakai Gonzalez, and I'm the director for our global programs at the Chamber. And I'm going to share just a couple of housekeeping items before we formally begin the program this morning. This is positioned as a Zoom webinar, so the visual and audio for our attendees has been disabled. But we do encourage you to communicate with us and our fellow panelists and honorees through the chat function on the bottom of your screen. You'll also have the ability to pose questions to our panelists during the live Q&A portion of the program. You'll find a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen where you can submit your questions. With that, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome our Chamber CEO and President, Maria Salinas. Great, thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for those uh, in that introduction and for getting us set off uh, today. Uh, good morning and welcome to the World Trade Week Southern California and our panel discussion that we'll be having today on successful export strategies, building business connections. I'm truly honored to welcome all of you here today. We have an exciting lineup and just some amazing uh, individuals that you will be hearing from. Since 1935, World Trade Week has held a long tradition of celebrating those that impact global trade. Each year, the World Trade Week Southern California Awards Committee recognizes the significant accomplishments and contributions in the region's development of the global trade industry. Today, we are pleased to congratulate and feature exceptional companies receiving both the Export Achievement Awards and the Bob Kleist Leadership Award. The Export Achievement Award honors local companies that have de demonstrated success in exporting or have provided export services to others over the past two years. This year, we have the pleasure of honoring four exceptional recipients in this category. They are Meridian Finance Group, Phoenix Technology, Optical Zonu Corporation, and our own chamber board member, Novatech Nutraceuticals. The Bob Kleist Leadership Award is presented each year in honor of Bob Kleist, a recognized leader of world trade on the West Coast. Bob Kleist was a pillar of the international trade community and a mentor to many. He was known for advocating for Southern California's interest, promoting trade, for providing a path for the next generation of international leaders, traders, and professionals. Bob's last tenure was corporate advisor for Evergreen America Corporation, and he led the Los Angeles Steamship Association throughout his career. In 2003, Bob passed away but his legacy lives on. As he strongly believed international trade and economic opportunity would be the rising tide that lifts all nations. Before his passing in 2003, the World Trade Week Committee voted to present this award in the spirit of his enthusiasm in international trade. We are proud to feature the Maple Business Council as this year's recipient of the Bob Kleist Leadership Award. Congratulations once again to all the honorees. 
We look forward to hearing your insights on the panel discussion that will be held later uh, in this presentation. I would also like to take a moment and thank all of our wonderful sponsors supporting the World Trade Week Southern California initiative. We truly appreciate your support. It is now my pleasure to turn over the program to this year's World Trade Week Chair, Cindy Allen. She is Vice President of Regulatory Affairs with, Fe with FedEx Logistics. Thank you, Cindy, for your tremendous leadership. And this program is now yours. Cindy. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. It's a fabulous uh, morning to be with you. I wish I could be there in, in sunny California. Um, it, although I, I do want to take a moment to recognize all of the challenges that um, everyone is facing on, on the West Coast, uh, especially with some of the wildfires as well as the pandemic that's going on. But it is uh, my honor to serve as the uh, World Trade Week Chair. I do so in honor of my former colleague, Wayne Wegner, who was designated to be the chair this year, but who tragically passed away unexpectedly last year. Um, and I do want to take a moment to honor his contributions to the, the West Coast and specifically in Southern California, where his heart was. Um, I do hope you'll join us next week on September 22nd for our uh, traditional annual event where we'll speak a little bit more about Wayne. But today, um, it is my great honor to introduce to you our uh, featured speaker, who is Supervisor Katherine Barger. She is the chair of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, where she serves residents of the fifth super, super uh, district, let's just say district, um, the county's largest, and which includes 22 cities and 70 unincorporated communities. Um, she was born and raised in the fifth district and her family comes with deep roots in public service in, in Los Angeles. You can find her uh, full bio uh, on, on the website. Um, but I do want to point out she's an advocate for environmental and efforts to preserve open, open space, enhance parks, trails, recreational programs and facilities, as well as libraries and after school programs that serve local communities. I think that's really important in today's environment um, when you talk about, um, you know, dedication of public service. So, um, Supervisor Berger, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cindy. And it is a pleasure to be with you today. Um, to celebrate World Trade Week. I hope these virtual celebrations convey our respect for your accomplishments as award winners. I've had the opportunity to attend World Trade Week kickoff breakfast and was so impressed to see the widespread engagement and I see it again today. While I attended last year, I saw more than 800 participants representing the Consular Corps, our business community and elected officials. And I did learn a lot last year with your keynote speaker, Dr. Udo Lang, the Chief Executive Officer and President of FedEx Trade Networks, Transportation and Brokerage. I was fascinated with his talk. Through the celebrations, we know that they're different this year and we're gonna be postponing some, but I'm grateful we are still able to recognize this important event. The wait has made it even more rewarding. President Roosevelt proclaimed World Trade Week as a national observance in 1935 during the first week of May. And the LA Chamber has been a part of this observance since the beginning. It was their staff member, Stanley Olson, the manager of the World Trade Department, who really made this happen. Today, an award is presented in his name each year to an individual who has made an impact to our region regarding world trade. You'll be hearing more from this year's honoree along with the other awardees later in this program. In my role as a chair of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors this year, it has truly been humbling to see the impact of the mass closure of businesses and schools and to oversee the county's public health response to COVID. As you all can imagine, the closures have had a serious financial impact on workers and on our businesses. These losses also extend to those involved in foreign trade and investment here in Los Angeles County. We have all seen and felt the devastating widespread job losses, unemployment rates, and lives lost due to this pandemic. 
our region is hovering at around 20% mark for unemployment. Those numbers lag by about a month, and we believe that there is an undercount of those who are gig workers, which is a good portion of Los Angeles County. Regardless, these impacts have impacted the Los Angeles County budget, and we have begun to estimate losses of approximately one to $2 billion annually. We have done what we can by implementing a hiring freeze and eliminating employer contributions to the county savings plans for our workers. I know many businesses that are still open are taking similar measures. I have asked the LAEDC to share some information with me on the impacts of COVID on international trade in Los Angeles. The ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach have seen declines in monthly trade as a result of the trade war with China. These declines took a steeper dive in February and March due to the shutdown of manufacturing in China and other trading partners in Asia. It started to increase in April after Chinese factories ramped back up, and we expected to see more modest additional growth in the months ahead. Just recently, we've seen more activity in the port complex in preparation for an unexpected holiday shopping increase. In a report concerning investment trends between US and China, the economic research firm, the Rotom Group, found that after dropping to its seven-year low in 2019, the US-China phase one agreement set the scene for a positive 2020 outlook. But this pandemic has changed the outlook and current dynamics could alter the long-term picture. The immediate measures to contain the spread of this virus have obviously impacted deal-making and brought local economies to a halt. As a result of the economic closures and the physical restrictions, China's outbound FDI to the US came to an almost complete stop in the first quarter of this year. The report also concludes that recovery is likely in the second half of the year, but the year overall will certainly show the impact of this virus. China has been one of our key trading partners here, and with this loss, we will see changes. Because China has been one of the biggest investors over the past few years, we can anticipate the projection would be about the Rotom report found in the first quarter of this year, which is close to zero. According to Gene Soroka from the Port of Los Angeles, seven months into 2020, overall volumes are at a decline of more than 15% compared to 2019. The Port of Los Angeles is North America's leading seaport by container volume and cargo value. It facilitated $276 billion, $276 billion in trade in 2019. The San Pedro Port Complex provides one in nine jobs in the five county Southern California region. Trade supports more than 160,000 jobs in Los Angeles County. These challenges created by the projected loss provide us with a renewed understanding and an appreciation of the role logistics, transportation, and supply chains have in our local and international markets. The interconnectedness of our markets is at the forefront now more than ever before. There is so much to consider throughout the process. Ensuring accurate data accompanies a shipment, accurate inspection reports, tracking the ship it's on at the ship's arrival time, and finally, ensuring that it gets on the right tra truck or rail line from the port toward its final destination. The whole process allows for products to arrive in our stores or at our doors. It is astounding that we have this happening at the same time there is a record backlog at the California Employment Development Division because there are not enough operators to answer the phone. This highlights serious gaps in our process. COVID has shown us how far and how fast the government needs to move to adapt to the rapid changes. With telecom infrastructure and computer, com computer capacity, we've seen what happens when the government does not invest in important advancements. We see a similar issue with the devastating impacts in Northern California when we don't invest in the appropriate safety measures and un upkeep of electricity transmission lines or storage facilities. When we don't provide sufficient coverage for all our residents, 
We also see the devastating impacts this is having on our youth at home without access to internet because the demand is too high or the computer or Wi-Fi hotspot isn't strong enough. These investments are not cheap, but they are an important piece of establishing the infrastructure that helps our communities continue to work and learn from home during the safer at home public health orders. I want to look at a cost efficient and streamlined way for telecommunications companies to grow our 5G and broadband internet across Los Angeles County. Our communities are begging for more access. And I've seen that this pandemic has exacerbated existing problems. As our technology improves and we expand access and quality, it will be up to each of us to determine how best to meet the challenges of our changing landscape. For example, should businesses and companies ensure that employees are learning new technology to keep up? Should businesses move more things into the cloud? Even the Pentagon has updated their tech infrastructure into the cloud so it can be more access from anywhere. I see the problems when all your data is only available on a computer at your workplace or on a piece of paper in another location. This is the challenge our government and our courts are currently facing. We're working to transition these paper-based jobs to more tech savvy to allow employees to work from home. These questions have led to additional concerns. What about voting? What about your legislator voting by phone? How do you know people are going to really be working while at home? Do worker projections and labor laws apply to someone who is working from their home? Even at the county, as teleworking becomes more the norm, we are looking at what it means to the bottom line. We're evaluating whether we need to rent offices or parking spaces, or may even save money while our own budget is shrinking. We're also seeing the impact of teleworking on our freeway and commutes. And there are now options to live further from work that a traditional commute would not have enabled. This could foster more affordable housing options for people who otherwise would not have moved because of their job. There are creative solutions, and this is an exciting time to consider all the policy implications. But this does not minimize the disruption that closures to businesses, schools, and places of worship have had on our communities. Together, we will find solutions to this new way of working and living that is effective and sensitive to the needs of our residents. It has been an honor to speak with you today, and it is a pleasure to recognize our awardees. Each of them are acutely aware of how interconnected our markets are. And through their efforts, they are each making Los Angeles County a hub for world trade. I'd like to thank Cindy Allen, our world trade chair, who is the vice president, as you know, of regulatory affairs and compliance at FedEx Logistics for leading World Trade, World Trade Week through its virtual expansion this year. I'd also like to recognize my friend, Maria Salinas, president of the LA Area Chamber of Commerce for her leadership during this time. Incredible leaders like you will help propel us forward toward success. And I know and I'm confident that the resiliency I've seen is gonna make sure we get out on the other end stronger and better. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Barger, for your meaningful work, as well as for your comments highlighting the critical nature of trade in the region. Um, your work is, is very uh, noted in our area. Um, let's take now a look from, at videos from each of our award recipients. Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer Lee, president and co-founder of Nova Tech Nutraceuticals. It is a great honor to be selected as this year's award recipient. Novotech Nutraceuticals is a U.S. manufacturer that makes nutritional and functional ingredients in California. Novotech has three production lines, 
chelated minerals, omega-3 powders, and Nutri-C. Novotech has 75 types of chelated minerals from calcium, magnesium, to zinc. The patented omega-3 powders are converted from three kinds of omega-3 rich oil to powder form. On the other hand, Nutri-C is a highly effective vitamin C powder. There are three pillars that have kept this company growing and thriving throughout the years. The first pillar is innovation and quality in products and manufacturing. With patented technologies, Novotech makes products in the U.S. and apply the best practices of CGMP and SOPs. The second pillar is having a strong customer-centered team. Novotech's employees are well-trained in knowing the products and customers' needs. The third pillar of success is building a win-win culture with key customers. The president has been personally visiting key international customers year after year. This personal touch of reaching out has grown both Novotech's and clients' businesses together. Novotech has gained hundreds of customers and successfully exported to over 35 countries across six continents. Thanks to the organizations listed on the following screen, all of them make this award possible. Special thanks surely goes to LA Area Chamber of Commerce from all members of Novatech on this Expo Achievement Award. Thank you very much. I'm Gary Mendel, President of Meridian Finance Group. On behalf of my team and myself, I'd like to thank Jasmine Gonzalez, Julianne Hennessy, and everyone at the LA Area Chamber of Commerce for recognizing Meridian with the 2020 Export Achievement Award. The greatest challenge facing exporters and importers is obtaining financing for their international transactions. Companies in other countries don't have as much access to working capital as companies in the United States. So U.S. exporters and importers need to do business on competitive payment terms. Our company provides trade finance tools that exporters and importers and their lenders can use to do more business internationally. For example, trade credit insurance that protects open account sales against virtually all non-payment risks. Headquartered in Los Angeles for more than 25 years, we work with exporters and importers all over the country, supporting billions of dollars of trade annually, but we're especially gratified to serve companies in our local Southern California region. As part of the Global Texel Group, we also have offices in New York, London, Brussels, and Singapore, so we can provide companies here with access to the same trade finance tools as their competitors anywhere. While international trade today is running at nowhere near the volume it would have been if not for the pandemic, there's still plenty of business being transacted in COVID time. Meridian Finance Group is rising to the challenge with innovative trade credit tools to help exporters and importers make it through the downturn and plan strategically for the eventual economic recovery. Thanks again for this award. I would like to start by thanking the LHM of Commerce for its initiative trying to um, recognize export from local companies and specifically for choosing us this year for this award. We appreciate it very much. For years we were counting on word of mouth and web searches for people to find us um, for export and that's basically how we build our export markets that actually grew to almost 30 percent of our total sales. We do that to make product for fiber optic uh, market. Uh, we serve uh, markets such as uh, cellular coverage enhancement. Uh, we also provide uh, satellite communication products. And finally, we do a lot of work for the military. We have decided to actually put a focus on export and the US commercial services have been specifically helpful in guiding us towards establishing a worldwide network of distributors. Um, the help of the US commercial services cannot be um, overemphasized. Without them, probably we would not have been able to access um, so many um, companies and to vet so many uh, potential distributors. So obviously, thank you, the US commercial services, for you, uh, um, uh, continuous support. And thank you, LA Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, the US Commercial Services. And we hope to report uh, in a year much success. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Angel Sanchez. I'm the Director of Global Operations for Phoenix Technology, Inc. of Riverside, California. We're a manufacturer of uh, safety equipment, primarily helmets for firefighters and first responders, and we are represented worldwide by over 95 distributors. So we are just under 50-year-old company based in California. We manufacture products that are entirely made in the United States, and we ship all over the world thanks to the help that we've received from organizations such as U.S. Commercial Service, the Small Business Administration, various chamber organizations, and many, many others. It's been less than 10 years that we've entered the international market. And the beginning was uh, a little rough and a little slow, and so you have to stay persistent. The other thing you have to do is you have to be very prepared. And so take advantage of the many free and low-cost courses that are offered and kind of dedicate staff to specifically work on international things. So um, some of our staff members have spent hundreds of hours in training, and they have a very good understanding of the various cultural, uh, legal, and statutory requirements of not only the United States, but other countries that we are looking to export to. In closing, I really want to recognize the people that make this possible. I'm kind of a spokesperson representing the company for this video, but the reality is we have a great group of family members who make this all happen. And so this award belongs to them. And I want to say thank you to the LA Chamber for not only the recognition that you've provided us with the Export Achievement Award, but also for everything that you do to help Southern California companies to become successful in beginning their exporting program and also to maintain that success for many, many years. Thank you to everyone. I hope you have a safe and prosperous 2020, and I look forward to hearing about all of your successful exporting programs. My name is Stephen Armstrong, and together with Robert Kelly, we co-founded Maple Business Council in 2015 as a nonprofit, membership-based organization to recognize, celebrate, and leverage the economic ties that Southern California and Canada share together. Hi, I'm Robert Kelly. It is a very special relationship, not only for its economic magnitude, some $44 billion a year in trade between California and Canada, and a tremendous source of inbound investment to SoCal, but for the friendship, trust, and partnership that our trade is built on. At Maple, we've brought attention to our economic ties at over 75 events to date across SoCal and Canada. Today, our members are located throughout Canada and Southern California and represent 20 different sectors. This is where the cross-border expertise lies. Our role is simply to connect people together through our events, delegations, storytelling platforms, partnerships, and news sharing, so we can all do more together. We're very honored to be the 2020 recipient of the prestigious Bob Kleist Award. This is an award that our members have won through their active participation and support, and we proudly share it with them. We'd also like to thank the Consulate General of Canada in Los Angeles for the tremendous work you do, and for how warmly you have supported our work from the very beginning. And representing our home in SoCal, we wish to especially thank the U.S. Commercial Service for this honor, with whom we've developed friendships and partnerships here and in Canada. And a special shout out to our friends at the Port and City of Long Beach for your original nomination. A big thanks goes to our friends at World Trade Center LA for your trust and support. And of course, to the LA Chamber for the outstanding work you do to bring together the incredible diverse strengths of the LA business community to celebrate and enrich this amazing city and region. Thank you and congratulations to each of you and your companies for achieving the success that you have and for, for being rewarded for that. I have the great honor today of having each of our recipients join us for a panel regarding the impacts that this pandemic has had. Um, so welcome to all of you as everyone is joining. I do want to remind everyone who's uh, viewing us today online to use the question and answer uh, section at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. We have some fabulous business minds from Southern California and now is your chance to uh, you know, benefit from 
their experience and their insight into what's going on today. So uh, for, for our first question, I'm actually going to uh, address this to, to Gary and to Angel. Um, can you tell us what challenges your company's had in the last six months, specifically, you know, delayed payments from customers, supply chain uncertainties, the financial markets, uh, instability, um, the, the challenges that you've had in each area, um, you know, meeting new customers. How do you do sales when you can't go visit uh, and travel's been restricted? Any HR issues that you've had? So uh, we'll ask you, Gary, to start first and then uh, turn it over to Angel and then um, if any of our other panelists have any comments. So Gary? Sure. At Meridian, we provide credit and financial services to companies who export all over the world. Uh, we work with companies nationwide, but we're especially proud of working with companies in our own backyard here in Southern California. Um, our clients who export have been dealing with growing demand for credit from their customers overseas for a long time, but the onset of the pandemic has really dialed that up to where companies in other countries who don't have the same kind of access to working capital as companies here have been demanding a lot more credit because they can't borrow from banks or other lenders in their own countries. And the payment terms have been getting longer. We say now net 90 is the new net 30 because companies in other countries expect 90 days or 120 days or even more to pay for goods. So this is putting a lot of pressure on US exporters both in terms of the risks they're taking when they export these larger dollar amounts on payment terms overseas and working capital challenges because when you're waiting 120 days to get paid from an overseas customer, um, unless you've got a heck of a lot of working capital, how do you keep filling new orders and continuing take, to take advantage of opportunities? Um, some sectors are really challenged, you know, uh, bricks and mortar retail, airlines, et cetera. But any number of other exporting sectors are doing quite well. There's an awful lot of, of trade in goods and services continuing. And, um, uh, you know, the challenges are replete. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you want me to go into any of the solutions or if that's for a future question. Well, let's turn it over to uh, Angel and get his comments and I think uh, open it up to the rest of the panelists for any other comments. And then Gary, I'd, I think our audience would love to hear some solutions after that. Angel. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I, you know, the best way to put it is D all of the above. We had every one of those challenges that we had to overcome. Uh, one of the things is we have a product that really is <laughs> kind of a touchy-feely product. And we had a number of trade shows around the world that were canceled, uh, which will have a significant impact on our ability to uh, meet and uh, identify new potential customers. Um, some of the things we did though, in preparation for this is really, when you look at the economic trade conflicts that took place a few years ago, all of our products are bought in the United States, but we were hit at that time with the domestic products drying up because everyone that couldn't purchase them from overseas were purchasing domestic and it kind of hurt us. So we took advantage of that historical knowledge and in January started looking at what was going on in Wuhan and started to talk about making plans, ordering additional product, getting ahead of the game. And then we formed in early February a pandemic response team uh, made up of le executive leadership and a few other people within our organization. We put together a continu continuity of operations plan that kind of helped us get through the supply chain issues, but it still was a challenge as we approached the fourth and fifth month uh, of the pandemic. Um, our distributors, we have 95 distributors roughly throughout the world, and most of the world, in addition to the United States, shut down. And so even to this day, we have, especially in Latin America, most of those distributors are not all able to make uh, what I would say is house calls to, to make those sales. So. <laughs> We had to overcome some of that. We, we pivoted, we started making face shields and doing some other things to help the response to the pandemic. Um, and really a lot of that had a, a pretty significant impact on our ability to stay afloat. Um, I'm very happy to say at this point, we are actually growing the business and we're starting to um, expand the number of employees we have. And uh, the delayed payments that Gary mentioned has definitely been an impact as well because we went from a, a pretty consistent net 30 to a lot of payments taking 60 to 90 days to come in. So 
try to hit all of those as quick as I could, but um, that's kind of how we've experienced the last six months. So Mayor, Stephen, Jennifer, any additional comments on how it's uh, impacted your business as well? I think the first uh, important to notice impact is actually Operation Heal, but I would try to focus on export because uh, for, first I had to make the company operation for American customers or for foreign customers. It, it, it was a huge challenge. But once we overcome it, I think that for us, reaching customer is the main challenge in export in any which way that we look at it. We need, we need to talk to them, we need to support them, we need to be um, in, in the mode of expanding or even introduce ourselves as a company because we are a small company in, in a big sea. So the challenge of reaching customer and reaching potential customers is the main challenge. And maybe there is some form of a, um, you know, of, of a benefit of moving towards a, a virtual world because people are more readily available, people are getting used to virtual conferences, and we are definitely leveraging it. So using that, um, some of it with the commercial services uh, help, we have reached a lot more people that we would have reached otherwise by travel. Um, we are using uh, virtual trade shows that are more effective, so there are a kind of a, um, a pivot point into the way that we are looking into export in the future, relying much more heavily on virtual tools. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that um, we've all learned that we don't necessarily have to be there in person to, to, to uh, connect to people. And I think that's a, a, a great opportunity. Jennifer, I don't know if you had any additional comments on some of the challenges that your company has had in, in uh, specifically in the supply chain. I imagine it's been very challenging for you. And yes, we immediately, uh, we diverse sourcing strategy on raw materials to address supply chain issue and negotiate with a few local vendors for our facility and the maintenance services to ensure there's no gap on material supply and services. And we also kind of emphasize like a production realignment. This is very important in terms of managing lead time and managing the machine utilization and over time authorization uh, to make sure there is no delay in production. Of course, financial conservation is another one. Uh, I do see the difficult time will last at least for another year. Yeah, the, I, I think that we're all trying to, to do that projection in the future. And, and Stephen, I think from the, you know, the, the Canadian side, um, it, it must be, um, you know, interesting to watch from the United States and, and the different um, approaches that the countries have had, but also the close trading partners uh, that, that the U.S. and Canada are, it, you know, I'd be interested in hearing what, what your experiences and some of the companies that you deal with have, have uh, you know, done to mitigate. Absolutely. And, you know, I think this is such an important economic relationship for L.A. and Southern California in terms of our economic ties with Canada. We have uh, $10 billion in goods and $5 billion in services every year that we export to Canada as our uh, second largest export market. And actually, if you look at it on a per capita basis, it's our number one export market. I think what's heartening a little bit, if we think about opportunities during this time of, of uh, economic stress and challenge, is that we don't have to look at the pandemic as exclusively defining uh, our trade situation uh, over the last few months, because we have the wonderful uh, activation of a brand new trade agreement, the USMCA, which came into force on July 1st. And that can be, you know, in a way, a kind of an antidote to some of the problems that the pandemic has presented us all. And Canada shares that along with the US and the California. And so now we have an agreement that is much more comprehensive, it's much more contemporary, you know, it embraces digital trade. And it not only um, uh, gives us clarity and predictability in terms of the rules of engagement for at least 16 years now, which is so important to businesses and their strategic planning. 
but it also um, addresses the quality of our trade. You know, things like um, gender equality and how do we help small businesses um, uh, do exporting more easily? Uh, and how do we look at environmental protection and integrate that into what we do in terms of our cross-border work? And so all of these are addressed to varying degrees within the new agreement that um, the 26-year-old NAFTA, you know, just be, by function primarily of being a, an artifact of the mid-1990s, wasn't able to do so. So I think I take heart in that, uh, that potential that we have to help kind of grease the wheels for more trade uh, in an already very strong and, and robust relationship to help us you know, navigate through the ongoing turbulence, which I think is going to continue on a protracted basis. But I think we're armed with something much stronger now uh, with this agreement. And that also you know, not only affects Canada, but you know, our relationship with Mexico too. Yeah, and, and regulations are at the heart of what I do every day in my in my daytime job. And I will tell you, I started my career when the Canada Free Trade Agreement was was uh, new, and then NAFTA, and now USMCA. I think it's a fantastic progression with our with our critical trade partner, Gary. You had mentioned that uh, you have some solutions or some poss possible possible um, ways to mitigate. I know our audience would love to hear a few thoughts from you before we move on to our next. question question well the the biggest growth we've seen is in the use of export credit insurance by companies in the u.s in england france germany japan any number of other countries close to half of all exporters including smes use trade credit insurance which is a insurance that exporters buy that protects against not getting paid by customers in other countries um, in the US, it's been a much smaller percentage and there's any number of historic and cultural and market reasons we could go into about why. But since the um, onset of the pandemic in just the last six months, there's been a dramatic increase in demand for credit insurance among US exporters to the extent that there now may be a possibility of, of the US catching up with these other markets. Companies using the export credit insurance to help them sleep at night as they're giving more credit internationally. Um, it's helping them extend more progressive credit to their distributors in other countries to keep those distributors stocking inventory and getting products staged closer to end users. And perhaps most importantly, as um, banks and other lenders in the US um, have become more and more concerned about um, uh, extending financing and providing working capital to exporters. It's been providing comfort to those lenders, even when the foreign receivables involve longer payment terms and so on, so that the lenders here will keep monetizing receivables and enabling uh, exporters to continue doing business. So I, I think there's any number of, of um, trade finance tools that U.S. exporters can avail themselves of at this time but trade credit insurance is the one that we've seen growing the most and providing the most added benefit. Yeah, anytime uh, you know a company can get protection, I think it's a, a good thing. Um, so I'm going to move on to our next question, um, and this is going to be to uh, first Jennifer and then to Stephen. How has your business and industry sector changed? Uh, do you see these changes as permanent? And is if there is a new normal, so to speak? Um, what will life look like for your business? And I know, Jennifer, you had indicated you think this is going to be the norm for another year or so. So I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, Novatech is specialized in manufacturing nutritional ingredients. In our dietary supplement industry, the demand for our ingredient, particularly for those benefit the immune system, has increased drastically because of the COVID-19. Now people are talking, taking more preventive measures to help their immune system. I foresee that demand will continue and it become a new normal. And the industry along with my company have a very good chance to grow in much faster path if we can grab this opportunity with a good plan and execution. Uh, Novatech has been doing well so far for this new normal, I see more challenge ahead of us. The first challenge 
is a production, uh, like a product demand. When demand is higher, we must allocate more resource on facility, equipment, and people for our production line. And the second challenge is recruiting, difficult to hire people. The third challenge is cash flow. As a manufacturer, we know the demand is high now, but we have to find a balance between the increasing the production capacity and the making investment in new machine and in new people wisely to reserve more cash at hand. The fourth ch uh, challenge um, is supply chain and inventory. In the past, uh, we should use a just-in-time approach to manage raw materials to fulfill customers' order. This uncertainty on supply chain has created a huge challenge for the just-in-time approach since it could delay the production. So the solution is to purchase more material to avoid a sh shortage. Uh, this creates a warehouse space issue. Therefore, we must expand the warehouse. The last, uh, not the least, uh, customer communication to increase understanding. It is even more important this day to have an uh, instant communication with customer on real time, such as uh, production scheduling and shipping status, since uncertainty might delay the production. So we must proactively get a customer's understanding on everything we do. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Stephen, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. What's, what's the new normal? Yeah. Well, frankly, when you're a membership-based organization, as Maple Business Council is, and our value proposition is, in part is based on bringing people together in person, you know, the limitations caused by the pandemic couldn't be more central to, to what we do. So like everyone else, we've pivoted to online programming to bring us together. And since the pandemic began, we've hosted more than one uh, event a month, which represents a significant increase to our quarterly cadence prior to the COVID uh, um, you know, starting. There is an upside though to virtual programs uh, that we're sharing together today. Uh, you know, we can welcome people beyond our local markets to connect with ideas and information, insights, so while we're not shaking hands or exchanging business cards in a room together, we can still be storytellers and broaden our reach. And I think we saw some of our, our resiliency as a community, as an organization from the power of content and content platforms have always been an important complement to networking programs. So in terms of our platforms for article and video based content, we've been able to continue to produce these. And these are avenues for our members to talk across their sectors about what they do and how they're navigating, you know, the current stress of the times so we can learn from one another. Um, and I think, you know, we all turn to community when there's times of stress and challenge. And just as we've uh, reached out more online to be able to connect, we've seen in our own community membership, it actually has grown over the last uh, six months or so as I think we all recognize the importance of learning from one another and that we're stronger together than trying to handle something as big as, as the pandemic on our own. That being said, I don't think us, we're gonna ever go back uh, strictly to in-person event programming alone. You know, we've all become more fluent, frankly, in communicating online. And we've seen how productive we can be, you know, with distributed remote workforces. So I think it's going to be a hybrid model where we're going to have a communities coming together online and in person uh, when we have uh, COVID behind us. And I think that's a good thing. You know, I think that's going to keep us uh, stronger and it's going to take the advantages of what we're doing uh, with events like today with our historic strengths and coming together, you know, for a traditional World Trade Week celebration. Yeah, thank you. And I can I can definitely echo that, you know, as a participant of many different um, conferences during the year in my position and meeting with, you know, government representatives, it, it certainly has changed the view um, and the approach. And uh, you do have to be a better storyteller because you have to be able to convey your message, um, you know, remotely via a video camera instead of, you know, being in person. And uh, Mayur, I'm really interested in the fiber optic 
plastic industry like you're in in the electronics industry I, I i'm interested in knowing how this is going to impact you and if you really see this changing given the critical nature of the internet, given the critical nature of electronic communications, I imagine um, this has had a significant impact on your business and, and how you see the future. Thank you, Sydney. Yes, it, we have seen, I mean, we are all living in a time by which the technology rate of change and technology adaptation is given and technology is uh, running faster and faster. And when we are hit by a pandemic that kind of, uh, kind of breaks the wool, which is coming on the heel of a trade war and kind of a somewhat uh, shaky world trade arena. And I would say that the, the most impact that I can see right now is the ambiguity as to the future of world trade agreements. I do see the, the relationship with Mexico and Canada is stable, but the rest of the world is difficult. There's still huge tariffs in South America. The relationship with China, both on the supply chain and as a customer, is very challenging to say the least. And I do not see stability in the, uh, over the horizon. And the pandemic is just exacerbating the issue. Doesn't help it in there. Um, particularly to us, we are not um, a trend leader. We're a niche solution provider. As a high-tech company that we have an IP, we are identifying areas by which we can solve problems differently and more cost-effectively than anyone else, but we are not trying to control markets or to control technology evolution because that way, um, you know, the, the commoditization and the government influence in the fiber optic field, and we have heard some of the trade wars of 5G, and this is just the top of the iceberg. There is a lot of subsidies that are going around, around it for commodities and a lot of shift in manufacturing. Even what is called American companies, it's not American products that are still produced mainly in China. So the effort to move away to other Asian company, we are participating in it as well as a small player. We see it as a game changer, but it's not going to happen quickly. The pandemic also affected some of our consumption. We supply a lot of product to airports, to uh, sports arenas, to convention centers. So obviously the, um, the rate of adaptation and the rate of construction have been reduced significantly and uh, our sales have was impacted that way. Um, we cannot uh, shift or pivot towards other technologies directly. So we have extended our effort and we are trying to expand our export um, effort with that. I must say that I, I, if I need to pitch uh, an advice to uh, people, um, CMTC, which is a kind of a, a nonprofit uh, organization that helps manufacturers to improve, to improve their efficiency and to explore um, other avenues of expansion was um, uh, behind us taking a particular seminar on export that enabled us to cement relationship with U.S. Um, com uh, um, uh, commercial trade. Uh, um, and with that, we expanded our distribution network and are having hopes for more export sales. So the challenges are there, both on the manufacturing side supply chain side and customer side, but we have to keep on uh, doing what we are doing best and uh, hope for some stability in uh, international trade because without international trade uh, stability and reliability, the challenges are going to continue with or without the pandemic. So when I say I don't expect a new normal, I don't think that we will have a new plateau that we will reach. We will reach a rate of change. I think the normal right now for us is the continuous change. We have to be adaptive, we have to be flexible because what we have done last year, we will not do this year and what we'll do next year is not what we've done this year. So the rate of change and the flexibility is the key to adaptation and the, the new normal is the rate of change.
Yeah, Angel, I saw you nodding your head when when uh, Mayer was talking about the export challenges. As a finalist for the, the SBA Exporter of the Year, the Small Business Association Exporter of the Year in the past, this, this seems to be something that kind of hits home for you. Um, you know, do you, what do you see as, as the new normal moving forward? Well, I think the big thing, from an internal perspective, we went from a very old school traditional manufacturing business with very little technology and a lot of uh, chisels and hammer type of methodology. Um, we've shifted that to very rapidly becoming uh, very tech savvy and it's allowed us to move a lot of our uh, workforce into remote, but also it has opened up some avenues for us to uh, meet with a global community in a very comfortable virtual environment and provide tools and resources to them so they can place orders, they can see product, um, they can get a much better perspective of what we had to offer. The other thing is the um, probably the old school methodology of handshakes and meeting people in person um, was expected with a lot of our customers. Today, you can't do that and they respect and understand that. And so now it's opened up a lot of doors for us to be able to say, instead of coming to you, would you be open to a Zoom meeting or a, a virtual meeting so that we can introduce you to um, our products, to our company, to our family members, which is what we call our employees. Um, and that is a pretty significant change and it's opened up some doors. And then of course, the um, incredible relationships we have like with US Commercial Service, which has allowed us to enter some markets that we really weren't looking at prior to the pandemic. So um, technologically we changed, we changed really understanding that you gotta be prepared for just about anything. And then of course, now we can start entering some markets virtually, which is used to be cost prohibitive. And now it's definitely something that we're able to do. Yeah, thank you. And, and as a provider to first responders, I'm sure they, they are thankful for that additional safety measure of not, you know, requiring that in-person touch. Um, that's, that's very important. Well, and I, I will also say that one of the good things that I think will come out of this is, especially in the developing countries, there is now a significant focus on PPE, um, where previously you would have, like the helmets we produce, you would see a department where they were sharing one helmet amongst 20 or 30 people. Now there's a focus on the fact that safety is paramount. And so um, I think we now will see a better standing for all of those, uh, especially in the developing countries. Thank you. And then um, for our last question, I'm gonna direct this to uh, Mayer and then Jennifer. Um, where do we see, do you see opportunities uh, for growth in the international markets in the future? And, and how do you plan to pursue them? And then we'll open it up to, to the other panel participants. So Mayer. So um, for us, um, we identify, and it's independent of the pandemic, uh, we identify both South America by which we have a, uh, got some of our largest customer as a put as a, an expansion there is an important element for us but now without travel it's, it becomes a little bit more challenging um, and we have started an effort to put a base in china we have pivoted away from hong kong to singapore and again i don't want to go into politics so we are now um, have established a lot of relationship in singapore with many companies we have picked up distributors there and uh, we are doing a lot of virtual work. I think the virtual work is a tool that is a fantastic tool. We are doing things much faster. We could not have traveled and met so many people the way that we are doing it right now. Um, um, we, we also see a movement in uh, Europe. Um, some recognition by American companies is helping us there as well. And we are planning for a large event at the U.S. Embassy in Rome later this year or early next year, by which we get um, really a huge exposure to um, mover and shakers in, uh, that have an interest in the product uh, that, that we offer. I, I must say that historically, credit issue and payment was not a critical element for us. It was an issue, especially from Europe. We solve it on our own without the credit insurance, and so far we are kind of managing to, to hold it. Uh, but maybe that's specifically to our financial situation. I just want to again say that the most important thing that I can see moving forward is the virtual um, uh, trade show and the electronic communications. And we look to it to really expand ourselves way beyond our size because electronically the image 
doesn't matter if you have a booth that costs uh, $200,000 to produce uh, and ship abroad, or you have a desktop table in a trade show. So on those trade shows, you have a disadvantage. Now we don't have it that much, and we have a higher exposure, and I think we can reach more people. Thank you. And Jennifer, your comments. Uh, okay. For us, I see the international market has a tremendous growth opportunity for our industry. Made in USA does make a difference. International business accounts for a major portion of our business in terms of size, time required, and investments. We have exported to our product to 35 countries. I have visited overseas customer year after year. This personal touch has grown our international business well. So far, the emailing, Zoom meeting are working, but the personal visits are crucial to maintain the win-win relationship. In addition, uh, we will identify the popular products that benefit immune system to increase international sales. Also focus on research and development. Uh, for those we have done well, we will continue such as uh, register more trademarks in other countries, join venture to conduct a trial study on their market, learn other countries' rules and regulations, and continue to develop a partnership in our niche products. They are what, uh, this is what we will do. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Stephen, I'd love to hear your perspective from some of your member com companies. You know, where do you see the, the, the opportunities in the international markets? You know, the U.S. is considered an international market for, I imagine, some of your Canadian companies. And then as well, you know, the dynamic partnership uh, between the two countries as well as, you know, the rest of the world. I'd love to hear your comments on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, certainly. And California looms large in terms of Canada's focus uh, with the U.S. in terms of uh, trading. Um, I think on a sector focus, one trend that's been really exciting to watch is the growth of e-commerce in Canada earlier this year. It's tripled in size. And, uh, you know, two thirds of Canadians have shopped online with a product that was shipped from outside of the country. You compare that to the United States and the number is 20 percent. So there's a huge opportunity for uh, LA County area exporters to take advantage of that appetite that Canadians have for American products and to be able to serve that market. And the, um, you know, the different uh, terms now of the USMCA agreement make, uh, make it easier to do so and easier to learn about how to do that kind of trade. I think within Canada, there's some areas to point out. You know, just two hours away from LAX is British Columbia. That's closer than Austin, Texas. And it's a huge market, same time zone. A lot of the shared values with California, fellow Pacific Rim gateway market, a lot of technology, a lot of uh, collaboration with LA and filmed entertainment, gaming and re related digital technologies. So that's a very, uh, you know, close um, geographic opportunity with respect to our second largest trading partner. And then there's, you know, markets like Ontario and Quebec who uh, represent the two largest sources of Canadian investment in Los Angeles. Ontario itself has a population of 14 million. GDP is 40% size of Canada and has over 22,000 tech companies, which is second only to California. So the tremendous opportunities for collaboration in California and Canada on the tech side. And when you do business with Canada and in Canada, then there's a point of entry to more free trade agreements that Canada has signed with 51 countries that reaches an additional market of 1.5 billion consumers. So I think that's important that we look at our trusted supply chain partners that are close to us. And you know, we talked about some of the, the um, challenges globally um, earlier today. I think you know, our, our trusted relationships, we need to count on more than ever. And what's I think really nice in terms of the relationship with Canada is that Canada has been invested in the success of LA for a long time now. So I can look over just to the fashion district, for example, in downtown LA, where one of our members, Brookfield Properties, is investing $200 million to transform the historic fashion mart to make it a new community hub between tech and fashion. And this is a historic uh, LA you know, sector strength that is getting injected with a lot of adrenaline with this investment. And so why not do business more in trade with partners that are also looking at our backyard and saying, we want to put money in to help grow and strengthen LA. 
Thank you. And, and Gary, I'd, I'd like to hear your perspective from the trade finance uh, area. Do you see certain areas that really are kind of hot spots um, internationally that uh, the, the member companies can, can really benefit from? Where do you see the, the potential most uh, in your experience? Um, other than in certain sectors, there's, it's, it's more of a shorter list of the ones where we don't. Um, you know, some industries, I think were struggling well before this started, and this has pushed them over the edge, like bricks and mortar retail, like legacy airlines, like, you know, um, oil and gas. There are certain sectors which there are real questions about what their long-term future looks like after we come out of being in the soup that we're in now. But because we're in the middle of what we're in the middle of and there's so much uncertainty, it's difficult to see past. I certainly don't know what the timing's going to be. Um, you know, Jennifer said before, we may be another year. It may go longer. I'm not gleeful about that. I'm jonesing for getting back with my friends and with, with clients and colleagues and go to conferences, all the things that we, that we do to grow business. But um, we don't know how long this is going to go on for. And it's, of course, we have our own issues in the United States, but you look at the resurgences of the pandemic in other countries that had more promising starts. We don't know where the resolution is going to be. Having said that, um, from everything we're seeing across the many sectors that our clients are in, we believe in a robust um, um, recovery to come, whether that's going to be starting third quarter next year or sometime in 2022. We think that the growth of international trade is inexorable and that you look at the demand that's been happening over the last few decades as more and more people, more and more consumers in other countries. I, I know it's motherhood and apple pie to remind everyone of this, but the U.S. has less than 5% of the world's population and perhaps 20% of the world's GDP. And that means the vast majority of buying power is in other countries or products coming from here. And, and that um, demand for goods and services is pent up right now. And when the recovery comes, whether it's going to be V-shaped or U-shaped or W-shaped or whatever it's going to look like, I think it's going to put real challenges on um, all, all different companies in terms of how we gear up to produce enough and how we work with um, uh, the, the, the rapid acceleration against coming out of this high risk period. So I, I think it is important to look ahead, even if we don't know the timing, to a period where we're going to see um, dramatic increases in international trade, not only exporting, but also, but also um, uh, import. Um, I, I don't know just what the new normal is going to look like. I don't think it's going to look just like the old normal, but I also don't think we're going to be doing business the way we're doing it today forever. I think there's going to be you know, I, I can only imagine what it felt like six months into the um, 1918 epidemic that went on for two years. Um, you know, it, it's difficult to see the forest for the trees right now, but uh, I think it's important to continue to have a long view. Thank you. And, you know, in closing, I'd like to ask each one of you, you know, to give me a very short um, answer and I'll start, you know, what is the, the biggest impact that you've seen for your company, for you and your company during the pandemic? And for, for us, uh, you know, for me personally, and I would say for FedEx, it would be e-commerce, you know, the, the vital nature of e-commerce, the fact that I can uh, not only buy my own supplies and groceries, but I can order them for my, you know, 78 year old mother uh, and have them delivered so she can stay safe is, is critical for me. And I think that's really what's changed in, in my world, both personally and professionally. Um, but I, I'll start with you, Stephen. You know, what, what is the single biggest impact this in, a pandemic has had? I think, you know, in a, in a strange way, it's, it's about reflecting on relationships and the importance of, of uh, appreciating our partners around the world uh, our, I, I love the comment made about team members being family members in our companies and uh, who we work with, you know, in our organizations, the associations that we belong to, our customers, our advisors, our boards, 
you know, we all are challenged right now to maintain and nurture these relationships, but I think we've all invested in these relationships to overcome the physical challenges of not being together. And I think that's a key takeaway that we're going to come out of this stronger, recognizing the power of community and that community can be defined in a lot of different ways. And I think that's going to uh, equip us all to do better in the future. And uh, Jennifer, what, what would you say is single biggest impact? I think it's important to build up a survival plan to keep the company running and address this uncertainty. So uh, I think, uh, for example, like a few strategy will be like employee realignment, uh, integrated with supply and vendors, customer communication, and also production realignment and the financial conservation. I feel those are important strategy to build up. And uh, we know like uh, uh, when we're struggling to keep our head above the water to search for positive opportunity, okay? If our negative, negativity to positivity. So, you know, like opportunity are for those who are prepared. So I think like uh, there's a lot of impact. We need to have a survival plan, but also there are, there are a lot of opportunities. But that's a great point. Uh, Mayer, what for you? I think from, from a 20,000 feet uh, point of view, is this, will, this pandemic will brought the virtual revolution. We will have virtual reality, we'll have virtual, we, we will move much more to electronic tools on communication. The way that we have done business with the travel, with shaking hands, we develop relationship, we will have to learn how to develop relationship remotely and how to develop and cement them without the traditional, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, impersonal contact. I think uh, the fastest we'll adapt to it, the more productive we will be. The issue of internal production and supply chain, we have to adapt. We always have to be on our toes to look what's coming and where it's coming. Um, we, all, you know, we have pandemics on one side, we have fires from another side, we have a world trade issue from a third side. We, we have to be prepared, there's no question about it. But as a fundamental change, looking at it 10 years from now, I think what we will see is the change of how business is done, and how electronic tools are being used. And Gary, what, what are your comments? Oh, I, <clears throat> I have to go with the same as we've said about getting together with people face to face. Um, there's simply no replacement um, for business, for personal. Um, I'm a jazz musician on the weekends and I've been playing with my band electronically and, and we manage, there are tools but it just ain't the same. And it's the same with the relationships in business, as Jennifer said, um, you know, we're social creatures, getting together face-to-face -face and meeting. I, I, I think that has to resume. Conferences with a thousand people, that's the thing I struggle with more as I learn about the epidemiology of, the, of this kind of pandemic and future ones. I, I really enjoy going to conferences and meeting with large numbers of industry colleagues that seems the more difficult one to see how that resumes like it used to. But I think one-on-one -on -one meetings and getting together with clients and suppliers and so on, I think that has to and will resume as, as, as we get past this. Thank you. And, and uh, in closing, Angel. Yeah, you know, the, absolutely what everyone said, but Stephen hit on the, the keyword, I think, and that's community. And one of the things we found um, within our family members is we actually strengthened and came together. Um, some of the, the little things you gripe about and some of the drama that gets created in a standard workforce really almost got eliminated. And we do uh, satisfaction surveys that go out weekly and it's uh, through an a, a external program. And we saw a significant increase in most of the things that are important to the business, happiness being the most important. Uh, so that was a pretty big change. Uh, the other thing, of course, is technology. I mentioned that we went from really, really old school fighting moving towards technology because we didn't need it. Well, we learned quickly we do need it. And now we're much more advanced than we were um, and we're much more prepared for other, you know, it's not always just a pandemic. You have things like fires and floods and various natural disasters that hit. Um, we're prepared for those type of things. And it actually made us much more efficient because some of the mandatory changes 
put us into software programs and things that we became much more efficient. And now we've kind of had a, a different open eye view of maybe technology isn't so bad and it can allow us to become much more efficient and much more higher quality of a, an organization. Oh, thank you. What a great answer. I think that summarized uh, kind of all, all of our answers together. Um, I want to thank all the panelists and, and congratulations to you all for your awards today. Um, I do want to remind everyone who's watching to join us next week and for some of the other World Trade Week events. Uh, please go on to the um, LA Chamber website for, for more details and uh, thank you uh, for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate the participation and the award. Thank you very much.